health literacy matters is the tag that we're calling the series of trainings that we're doing and today we're going to focus on plain language and the teach back method so our objectives today are to define health literacy and look at the expanded definition we're going to review the four dimensions of health literacy which are access or obtaining understanding evaluating and applying the health information as well as looking at where those health literacy domains are, which are health cares, which we always immediately think of as when somebody is sick or ill. And you'll see a lot of the definitions always talk about the patient or the doctor or the provider. But we need to expand out and look at, it's also in disease prevention, as well as in health promotion. So there are those three domains that we need to be conscious of and know that it really applies to all of our work. Because a lot of times I hear folks say, well, I'm not a, a provider, so I don't need to be worried about um, the teach back method. Well, actually, that is something that we could do both in disease prevention as well as our health promotion. And then we're going to identify two universal precaution strategies um, that will um, help with uh, clear, or clear oral health communication and for our plain language. And one, we're going to do a plain language pledge. So we've got the four, three, two, one today. Um, so I need you guys to let me know if we hit those four, three, two, ones in the evaluation, okay? So what is health literacy? When we look at the individual aspect of it, we have this definition that was used most often. And this was used in the National Assessment of Adult Literacy in 2003, and they had to come up with a standardized definition that they could give to the so they could measure what the 19,000 folks who were English speaking adults answered. And this is what they came up with, is that it's the degree to which an individual have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate decisions. So this is the one that over the last uh, 20 years, because it actually, well, 19 years, <laughs> has been used a lot in the research. And a lot of times when we use our statistics, this is what it was based off of. As research has gone, as well as our practitioners, and especially um, a researcher by the name of uh, Kirsten Sorensen, who actually had taken a look at 17 different definitions and 12 different concepts and frameworks of health literacy. And they came up with realizing that it is more of an interaction between the demands of health systems and the skills of individuals. So we really have to think about that we're moving. We're moving beyond it being all the onus on the individual to have the skill set and to be able to navigate through these. We all play an important role in improving the outcomes related to health literacy. So the four dimensions, as we talked about, you saw them in the definition. And if we think about access and obtaining health information, where are some of the um, examples you can think of of where somebody might access or obtain health information? The internet. The internet. Anywhere else? Health educators. Health educators. Doctor's yeah. office. Doctor's office. Like the after visit summary that they receive. Very good. The after visit summaries. What about social or family dynamics? A lot of times people rely on their family to get their information from or their friends. Um, a lot of times friends or family can almost um, <laughs> trump out the health professional sometimes, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. But that's how important it is to realize that we are not the only places that they are gathering the information. So they're getting it on the internet, they're getting it through social interactions, they're getting it when they visit the 
um, doctor's office, maybe in their health classes in high school. Uh, so those are things to think about. Those are all the different venues. And we need to be thinking about that too in even the television. How many people have thought about what prescription they might take <laughs> based on a commercial that you saw during your favorite TV show? 30 years ago, that was not something of a place where we could access our health information was off of the internet, uh, or I mean off of the television commercials. <clears throat> and that has become a really important place to do that. Where do health professionals access or obtain health information? Up to date. Hmm? Up to date. Up to date? Okay. Nope, that's all right. I just, I didn't know I heard that. Up to date. Are there other places? Your education background? Peers. Your peers? Journals. Journals, articles. Uh, again, sometimes, um, and I know it's declining, but also the uh, drug, do, uh, I cannot speak today, the drug reps coming um, and doing presentations, asking doctors to go out and do presentations, conferences, workshops. Um, so those are all different places that they're obtaining the information. So it's important to realize that it is not just the individual obtaining and accessing, but we also need to realize where are we getting our information from. Understanding health information, this is really important is that I may gather the information after going Janice to the doctor and I get the handout afterwards, but if I don't understand what it actually says, it may not be a benefit to me. So that is something that we need to take into consideration when we're looking at how are we going to help improve our outcomes, is are we getting a message out there that helps people understand the information or are we also gauging the skills and the abilities um, to take into consideration somebody might have a limited health literacy? So is it written at a um, level that is comprehensible? Then we need to be able to process and appraise information. Tell me a little bit what that might mean to you of thinking about somebody processing or appraising the information. Understanding what it means. Okay, understanding what it means. Take, oh, go ahead. To use your TV uh, commercial, uh, like weighing the benefits versus like the side effects that they have. Very much like weighing, weighing the side effects and the pros and cons. Um, if you saw the t television commercial, based off of that as well is that uh, think about people who smoke. A lot of times they've accessed the information they know that it's harmful for their health, or they've accessed it. Now they understand it. They've gone through and they realize that if they continue smoking, that there are potential hazards to their health. So this third thing is where they start to process and appraise the information. Sometimes outside um, stimulants or outside um, resources are going to influence whether they make that decision or not. So they may be too stressed at a point and they don't have or they don't have the income to get the nicotine patches or it might be a bad uh, example because I think there's a lot of uh, cessation programs at this point. But you understand where I'm going with it is that there might be outside factors that even though somebody can access and understand the information the next step is being able to process and appraise how it, it fits to them and then apply and use that. So we need to remember those four dimensions of health literacy is that it's not just providing the information, it's not just giving them access, um, it's also, and it's not just making sure they understand it, but I think I used the example the last time about how I seem to be um, not capable of taking my antibiotic if it's prescribed four times a day. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but if my provider works with me, yes, I, I have the information that I need to take it. I understand that if I don't, I have the likelihood of um, continuing to be sick with a upper respiratory or sinus infection. 
I can process the information, but can my provider process it with me and say, how are you going to take it? So if four times are really difficult and I have no other option but to give you this medication, how can we work together so that you're going to, you're going to be able to take it? What do you do during the day? And then you break down through and come up with ways that I might be more successful at being able to um, put that in. Or the doctor says, I just don't see how you're going to take it four times a day, so let's uh, uh, switch that to the one time a day. I think that'll uh, be as effective. It'll be more effective because you'll actually take it. <laughs> um, and so we go from there. And then I'm able to apply the information and say, okay, I really need to figure out four times a day if that's what happened because of the following. And we talked about the three domains is that we need to move beyond just healthcare in the times of si sickness. We need to be thinking about prevention and when we're giving our message and how we're interacting and where we're allowing our folks to find that information. A lot of times, unless it's really pertinent to you, we skip over things. Uh, take, for example, advanced directives. How many of you in the room have an advanced directive at this point? Okay, there's only three hands that went up in this room. Now, all of us, look like we're over the age of 20 um, and we're of legal age that we could be making those decisions. Yet a lot of us think we have got plenty of time to take care of it. Two and a half years ago I was in a pretty severe car accident and I didn't have one in place. Luckily I was still able to communicate but it really made me stop and think about hmm <laughs> better do that. Well, now that it applies to me, I see information all over the place about advanced directives and palliative care and all of these things that I have to tell you that I walk through our community never seen before. So if it, it doesn't feel pertinent to us at the time, even though the information is out there, we need to be thinking about how can we um, present that information so that it is um, pertinent to people as well as the health promotion. And that again goes back into that of making sure that we're acknowledging that those are the three different areas. So if we put the four dimensions and the three domains together, that comes up with the 12 different uh, subdivision, sub dimensions. And we're not gonna go all the way into that today, but I want you to know that this will be on um, your handouts that you'll get um, in the email that talks about the different ways, like for disease prevention, the first uh, dimension of the ability to access information on risk factors. So it changes what information is needed based on which domain that you're looking at. All right, so if we looked at that expanded definition, we wanna make sure that we are looking at the interactions between everybody involved, which means the health professionals, and that's why you're here today, is that it's your capacity to communicate clearly, educate about health, and empower your consumers. Okay, so it's really important to realize that you have a really important role in this system, as well as our healthcare system's capacity to balance the skills of individuals and the complex demands of their organization. So you may have a lot of forms that need to be filled out and it is just the way it is. There's all those release of information, you have to have the informed consent, you might have eligibility requirements for your community programs, for the prevention programs, for the health promotion. You can't skirt around that. You have to have them. But it doesn't mean that we have to present them in the most complicated way possible. So in 2010, uh, President Obama um, approved the Plain Act 
um, of 2010, which means any government agency who has forms must comply to making sure that it is um, easy and simple for folks to read. Think of the Veterans Administration. A lot of veterans were coming back and losing out on their benefits because they weren't able to interpret what the um, communications were telling them to do. So those are just ways that it's really important to realize it isn't just about the individual sitting across from you. Also, I want you to know that the scope of the problem that nearly nine out of 10 adults will struggle with health information. A lot of people find that unbelievable and especially the health profession finds that unbelievable because it's that curse of knowledge. Everybody in the health professional ha knows that information because they've gone to school, they work in that setting every day and we can't believe that folks don't know that information. But it isn't their everyday language. And we tend to write at a 12th grade or higher level when the most of the population reads at 8th grade or less. If you look at it, it's usually more geared towards 5th grade. Um, highest risk for the limited health literacy are our most vulnerable populations. So it's really important they've already got a lot of issues of social determinants of health stacked up against them. Health literacy is one of those that we can help with. And safety. Out of 395 primary care patients in three states, there was a study done. 46 of them did not understand instructions on more than one label. And 38% with adequate literacy missed at least one of the labels. So it's really important <coughs> to know that safety and our outcomes are impacted by this. So if going back to your organizations to try to express why this is important for you and your team to take on, we look at um, our safety as one of the biggest reasons. As well as right now, healthcare is uncompared at a combined of 17.5 of our gross domestic product is in healthcare. So individuals with low literacy are going to spend 10,000 more in healthcare costs compared to individuals with a higher level. And they'll also spend $1,000 more in inpatient if they're in the hospital than their counterparts. So cost is a major impact. We're looking at between 106 and $238 billion estimated that are annually spent as a result of low health literacy. One in every six hospitalizations is a result of some type of medical ed, um, medication adherence issue. So it's really important to understand how much we're spending annually on our healthcare system. And that goes to utilizing the right type of services urgent care versus emergency room versus primary care versus the convenient care, the teledoc. So there are a lot of different um, options for us and getting people to utilize the system that works best for them. We have a lot of people that will go to the emergency room when they have a severe, you know, they've got a headache and it comes to find out they need glasses. And so they spent $300 on an emergency visit <laughs> when you know going to um, an eye doctor to be able to be tested or to the you know an optometrist would have been a lot more um, affordable on that okay I am going to have you look up here find your insurance terminology and have at it Okay. You had a pile of papers in front of you. And I asked you to pull out the form of the insurance terminology and you had a little tiny direction here. Which by the way is in passive voice. <laughs> because it says the crossword puzzle will be completed by participants. And we'll get to that a little later about why that's not correct. 
Tell me how this felt doing this exercise right from the beginning of it. Thanks for the free, free word. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the one free word. I mean, they were, <clears throat> they were very vague, so it was hard to figure out which component of the health insurance that they were talking about. Mm -hmm. So the vagueness, um, that made it difficult. Are there any, I saw a lot of furrowed brows. What else kind of made this a uh, challenging exercise? It was like, there, was more, there was like a phrase in each box, it was more than one word. Ah, yeah, so it wasn't very clear that it could be more than one word across. It was like, I know what this is. If I had a, a, a word list, I could pick it out. Ah, but yes. I had to pull it up from my memory now. So it was vague, but you felt like if there had been a glossary, it would have been easy to match, easier to match, and say, oh, this is open enrollment. Well, and there were some that, to that point, there were some that, like, I knew, but <clears throat> when I counted it out, it was like, oh, well, that, I guess I don't know the exact term. The exact term. Anything else? How about the, how it looks? Anything about how the form looks? Maybe it's just me and my eyesight getting, it's, small. it's pretty small. <laughs> and the letters, you know, on there, and then trying to go back up to the top to find in which seemed like kind of a small. The answer key is even smaller. <laughs> and I'll get that out to you guys uh, before you leave if you want to. But it wasn't as much about what are the actual terms that I wanted you to see in this exercise. It's more to think about when you sit in front of somebody or the information you're giving them, you had all of the information there, but did you have all of the information to do the four things, the four dimensions? Could you really go through, do you know what I mean, and hit all of those? So a lot of times we think we've done a great job of handing out the information that the you have it, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't mean that we're successful. And I didn't check actually to see if you had the correct answers. <laughs> <Did I? laughs> so that was just a fun way to do that. So what do we learn from our patients? We learn that they want us to tell them what is wrong with them and make it personal and brief. So what do I need to do and why? And emphasize the benefits. So the ask me three, this goes back to that. Ask me three, what is my main problem? What do I need to do and why is it important? Those are the three things that your folks, whether you're doing disease prevention, whether you're doing health promotion, or you're doing health care, those are the three messages that folks really need to know. Because remember, if we're going to make any behavior changes, it really needs to be important to us. Um, a lot of times if we're not invested in it, we're not going to be able to make those um, changes as well as we're not necessarily going to try to apply or process the information if we do not know the, the benefits. There's a commercial out where, again, the drug companies where they're interviewing people with diabetes. And one of the questions is do they know about um, the heart risk that's associated with diabetics? And it was amazing to see in the interviews how many of them don't realize the side effects that can happen from their diabetes. They know they have di they're diabetic, and they know that they should um, monitor it, but they aren't very good at being able to express or process what the consequences of having um, diabetes is. If you're talking about medications, this is a real practical way of being able to talk about what is it for and how do you take it concretely. Like if it's, if it's two times a day, you take it in the morning and you take it at night or you take it in the afternoon or you take it with food, you take it without food. What does without food mean? You can't eat within two hours of taking that. So that's being very specific and concrete around that versus our uh, generic um, instructions. Remember that 
36% or 38% of folks with adequate health literacy still struggled with being able to take their medications correctly based on how the directions of the labels were written. The why, the benefit, again, why is it important to me and what to expect? It's really important to let folks know if there's going to be side effects with it or if you're not going to feel the effects for two months or a month, why it's important to keep taking it anyways. Um, so those are really important to go over. But again, the tell me what's wrong, why do I need to do it and why, and emphasize the benefits. And remember, this is, I need to remember this a lot. What's clear to you is clear to you. <laughs> so that's really important is that you may be hearing yourself saying it as clear as possible. And you may be saying it very clear, but the person that you're talking to is not hearing that. So we need to make sure that you're checking in. Okay, we're going to do another crossword. And you should have in your packet this sheet, okay? And on the top it says medical jargon crossword puzzle, okay? Does everybody have that in their packets? Do you see that? Okay. So you should complete this, and you're going to have three minutes to complete it. The person with the most correct answers is going to get a gift certificate. You should not look at the back, because this would disqualify you from getting the gift certificate. Completing the crossword will actually help us gain an awareness of how we use medical jargon all the time you will be asked to share how many you have completed. So to make sure that I went over this and explained it as well as I could, can somebody tell me what we need to do? So, <laughs> so fill it out. Um, so we have three minutes to complete the crossword. Don't look on the back or you're disqualified. And if you complete it, you'll have a better understanding of the terms that you use on a daily basis that are medical. That sounds, that sounds good. I, I think I hit all of the points. So if everybody is ready, does anybody have any questions about that before we start? Okay, I'm gonna give you three minutes. Go ahead, it will be a Panera, another Panera gift certificate. Go ahead and work on that. I can give you one hint. If you want to ask the person next to you for some help, you can. We're going to stop. This is an activity that the Minnesota Health Literacy Partnership does. I modified this a little bit. Um, normally in their plain language, they just hand out these um, and you can go over that or do it in a staff meeting or something like that. But I wanted to take a look at and talk about the difference between the first way that I asked you to do it and the second way. The second way, how did it feel? A more relaxed? Explain it more. Okay. There was an uh, explanation, relaxed. Anything else? I feel like giving it this short time limit actually made it more stressful for me. Okay. Because there was not a time frame identified with the first one. Okay, so the time frame added some stress to that. That's good. I was glad for the time limit because the first one, it was such a big crossword. I'm just thinking that I have a lot of time. And like right. two minutes later, they're like, okay, time's up. And I was like... So that the time limit actually helped... Uh, Mary Kay because she was able to see that I need to get to this right away versus having a lot of time with the first one and not knowing what the expectations were. Did the knowing that you were going to get a gift certificate make any difference for anyone? Nothing. Not for you? So it's really important to remember that sometimes our incentives do not have meaning to people. We think, oh, this is a great idea. This will get them to do that. I purposely picked Panera versus my favorite of Dunkin' Donut because not everybody 
has a Dunkin' Do or I mean a Panera in their community that's sitting here today. So some of you had a better like, oh, I can go right there and it's easy to access. Whereas others that in same incentive did not have the same access. And it also did not, some people may not like Panera. Some people may not like coffee. So my point is, is that a lot of times we think we're being very clever with how we incentivize our folks. And we have to realize that we need to know our audience. You need to know what makes them want to get the information. How is a really good way to know your audience? Ask them. Ask them? How else? What's around them? Like their environment? So do a little research and look at that. So how would you ask them? What, what would be a good way to help you meet your goals? Okay. So he would actually want to put it out and say how would what would be a good way to help you meet your goals? Would you do it in a survey? Would you do it one-on-one? -on -one? How would you record your uh, audience's feedback? I, mean, I think it depends on what you're trying to get at. I mean, if you're trying to get generalized population level information, then a survey is probably fine as long as you get enough um, responses to make it valid. But if you're trying to create specific care plans, then a one-on-one -on -one setting is more appropriate. So we're talking about today of really knowing what you're trying to get at, whether or not you need a big um, number of folks to be able to survey to get an accurate number, or you're trying to do the care plans, as he said. So again, it's knowing what you're trying to get. So what is the message? What is the purpose of your communication? If you know that, it's much easier then to be able to craft, and we're going to talk about sites that will help you realize how to craft it, because when we, we're going to talk about chunking it down into three easy parts, okay? The other thing is, is that it's okay to include in your audiences, in your, um, your teams. If you're doing program development, there should be one of your clients, consumers, patients, one of your audiences on those teams being able to, or passing the information in front of them and saying, you know, what does this mean? One of the examples that was really interesting of this drawing, it was just stick figures, or not stick figures, but a very um, uh, basic drawing of a woman sitting in a chair with another woman standing by her, and the audience was intended to be um, for Puerto Ricans. But because of simple drawings on the woman's um, shirt and on the chair, when the audience was asked, who do you think this material is for, they said uh, Mexicans, because it had the um, design of what they associated with. When they took the design off of the shirt and the chair, the same picture, they asked another group, and they said, oh, it's for Puerto Ricans. So you have to be really conscious of having somebody look at it because again my assumption of my how I'm going to communicate may not hit that audience that you're looking for. Did it help to tell you why we were going to do the crossword puzzle? Yeah. Having a little bit of an understanding of like I'm not just over here wasting my time I want you to fill out a <laughs> crossword, but that we're actually going to use it and that we're going to review it. I went through that pretty quickly. It's not of a, um, we would have spent more time if we really wanted to get out of it, um, learning the jargon and those type of things. But today's activity of this was more to be about how you present it. I also used a visual while I did it and I showed you which one it was. I could have done a, a better job of like color coordinating it and saying the purple sheet, do you know what I mean, and held that up. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can do that to identify. I also tried to do a little bit of the teach back of I checked in, did you get the gist of what I asked? I allowed other people to be able to um, ask questions if they needed to. So I evaluated that it seemed like people were on the right page. And then I went forward with that. Also checked in to see if anybody wanted any um, hints, those type of things. So 
keeping that in mind that there are different ways that you can present very simple items. The one reason I did this also is I think a lot of times people who are doing presentations like this, they think, well, the teach back doesn't apply to me. That's the provider sitting across. I want the provider to do the teach back. If you're doing presentations, you need to also be doing the teach back method and making sure that what you're conveying is being understood. And then if it is not, adjusting to be able to uh, communicate it in a way that is helpful. So what is clear to you is clear to you. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, I think the stuff on this crash board, um, you kind of made it seem like, OK, if we didn't know everything, like you made it feel like like we're going to review it. And you're like, well, if you want to talk to me, we're like, you made it like, OK, that we didn't know everything. Yes, very. that was the other aspect of being able to um, break down those barriers that you have to do it yourself kind of a thing. So very good. Okay, the other thing that we have a problem with and is that when we talk about jargon and then we say just don't use jargon, don't use all those big words, it's not just one jargon word. It's not just use plain language and everything will be fine. If we look at it, there are different descriptions. We have phrases that um, only have certain meanings in the clinical setting. So there's descriptions, like a glucometer. There isn't, you know what I mean? Like those are very specific words and go down through. But phrases and acronyms, those are other things that we need to be aware of, of how we use, is that a phrase may also be um, jargon in that it's not just one word, as well as concepts. And in the technical area, that, you know, we can identify those. But sometimes we even use jargon when we try to use plain language. Can somebody think of um, a plain language or a way to make it simple that might be jargon as well? Just citing one of the examples you gave up there, primary care physician, PCP. Yeah. Right? It, in the medical field, you constantly are saying that, uh, at least for us, and then to say that to somebody outside the medical field, they don't know what you're talking about. And oh, definitely. it's, it's got to be reworded. Are there any other in, Rich, you're in the mental health field. Can you think of any um, either phrases or jargon type concepts that apply to your field? Uh, we use them all the time. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but. <laughs> yeah, we, we use them all the time. They're very. Um, in terms like well, with the non-compliance term, it's a nerve with me too. It's, it's used a lot. Resistant things that are not just jargon, but they're mislabeling the situation. Yes. So client yep. is misled, uh, resistant because exactly. he or she doesn't understand what you're trying to explain, exactly. or doesn't have incentive or motivation. Those aren't some of the more technical terms. But no, but that is right, yes. A modality, treatment modality, yep. uh, or even just a treatment plan. We talk about all the time the average client doesn't know or care much about it unless we really sit down and say, this is the purpose of it, and, and have the person involved in the development of something like a treatment plan. I think it, going along with mental health stuff, I think sometimes, especially I see it with mental health, where we train like OCD, um, so OCD, like, no one really, or I'm depressed, like even those kinds of diagnoses that we use, SUD, yeah, I have anxiety, well. ADD, yeah. Yeah, right. It's in common language, not people even using right. bipolar right. very yes. loosely, mm -hmm. yeah. yep. even in, among professionals where it's, mm -hmm. that's, not what we're talking about. Right, so we've got very technical and we're using acronyms all the time and we're throwing them around within our own profession and then we may be doing a cross-disciplinary meeting and folks who don't work in the mental health might be like, I have no idea what those terms are. Do you know what I mean? And they may have missed a really important thing. But I'm all, oh, uh, Joel. Well, I was just thinking other common things, like I was thinking PCP, now I work with uh, I have worked with people coming out of addiction. PCP means something totally different to them. Yeah. And, <laughs> That's very uh, true. And, and so, you know, I, I've had to clarify that. I think even using the term like uh, mindfulness, yes. um, you know, we get that. And, and like, or even self-care. 
Yeah. Um, uh, things like that. A codependent. Yeah. Um, th those are some common words that are, that are thrown around rather casually. That's not necessarily like really therapeutic or really, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's it's it's kind of common language, if you will, but it's misunderstood a lot. So as Joel is saying, across um, the different disciplines, it has different meanings for different acronyms. So we need to be really careful about that. If we also look at phrases, even in our plain language, and I think, Rich, when I think about mental health, if I, when we're trying to talk to somebody about and using plain language instead of saying, are you depressed? In my family, someone might say, are you blah? Are you blue? You know, and so that has reference to my family, but someone else of a different culture or even in a you know, different generation, those may not um, have the same uh, reference. Yeah, that could mean a whole bunch of different things. So some people are feeling depressed as we might see it as a mental health professional, but <clears throat> they're not labeling that at all or traumatized. So right. really breaking down some of those terms so that we have a common understanding of what we're talking about is really important, but those are that's a good example, depressed. Some people think if I'm able to get out of bed at all, then, then I can't be depressed. depressed. Right. And so when we are doing the teach back, there can even be some, you need to make sure that you're really getting clarification of understanding. Because somebody can say back the same words that you just said, but it may not mean that they're actually understanding that. So we can't just cut out jargon. It's more complex than that. We really have to take a look at how we do this. And the bottom line is, is that the only solution really is universal precaution is making sure that we're talking to all of the folks that we interact with, whether it's our peers, whether it's the folks that we, um, our clients or consumers that we're working with, or whether or not we're putting the information out onto the web page or crafting a health promotion. We need to be making sure that it is a universal precaution, that it is written in plain language, that it has been looked at for the message that the audience is the one we're trying to get, and that we're always checking for understanding. So those are what we're going to talk about today. So we did the four dimensions. We talked about the three domains. And now I want to talk about two of the universal precaution strategies that um, you can take back into your workplace and make a difference. When we look at them, you're going to look at the need to know and what the need to do. We're going to look at the teach back method. Also in these two different, um, the, we haven't gotten to the two yet, but you're going to also know that you can demonstrate, draw pictures, and also use your clearly written education materials interspersed. So when we talk about universal precaution and plain language or the teach back, it's not just by itself. It's a complex way of being able to in, intertwine these different strategies. So a tool, I'm giving you a tool today. And the plain language and the teach back method is what we're gonna hit. This plain language infographic, you can actually get at the Minnesota Health Literacy. There are places where you can make up your own infographics. But we're going to follow right along what this infographic, if it were hanging somewhere, talks about, that it is a tool. And that what is plain language? It's communicating your message the first time that people will understand it, so that your audience understands it the first time they hear it or read it. And that it allows people to find what they need, understand what they find, and act appropriately under understanding the four dimensions there, okay? So when you're doing plain language, you're always going back to those four dimensions of making sure that it's hitting those. It's not dumbing it down or, tending, or attempting to be folksy. That's really important. That's not respectful. So universal precaution is for people of all 
rating levels, okay? And when we're looking at trying to get out our message, we need to get it out in a way that is respectful, informative, and helps them be able to apply their information. Yes, it's kind of neat sometimes to do some catchy uh, campaigns, especially in the health promotion or the risk um, disease prevention. However, when we're looking at the um, actual information, like Janice, when you were talking about somebody leaves the doctor's office and they have that information in their hand, we want it to be um, so that it is easy to read, but we don't want it to be where somebody doesn't understand all the consequences to what they, uh, or not getting all the information that they need. A lot of times people think we're asking you to strip out the important information that somebody needs. And it's not. It's a matter of looking at all those jargon words that we looked at on the insurance as well as the um, medical side. You still need to have those words and you still need to talk to them about it, but we don't need to necessarily use our inside <laughs> vernacular that only we understand. And it is not imprecise. It needs to be to the point and um, clear. We use it to improve our communication. Showing patient focus. This is showing our patient-centered approaches so that when we communicate it is about you. It is not about us or what we need. We are going to learn how to write it in the way that it is focused on them. It eliminates barriers. If somebody understands what they need to do, we go back to the resistance or the adherence or the non-compliant. I am much li more likely to follow through and be compliant or adherent <laughs> if I understand what I'm doing um, and understand the first time. How many people have gotten a bill and not understood anything that it says on there and then tried to make a phone call in to talk to somebody about it only to be bounced around or you're the, your call is really important, we'll get to you in a hundred minutes, but <laughs> you know, kind of a thing, but I'm exaggerating. But the thing is, is that if there's a lot of um, barriers, if I can't get through to somebody or I can't understand it the first time I read, I'm much more likely not to follow through and do what I need to do. And then I have a problem because they're calling me and saying, why didn't you pay your bill? <laughs> um, it improves our patient <coughs> safety and it reduces time spending explaining and again, the adherence compliance issue. Plain language can make your message stand out, it can improve communication, and it shows patient focus again. When we talked about the barriers, improving patient safety, reduce time spent explaining, and improve adherence. So that's all along on there. Results you can really measure. So the, I mentioned the Veterans um, Affairs before. There was actually a letter that was sent out that prior to the letter being sent out, they were getting 1,128 calls a month. That meant that per counselor, they were fielding at least nine calls. When they sent out the revised letter using plain language, it dropped drastically to 192 per month to only two per um, counselor. Imagine what you can do with your time if you're not re trying to return phone calls, trying to get back to the person where it says, oh, you haven't set up your voicemail yet, <laughs> or your voicemail is box is full, and so you can't actually even get a hold of that. And so it frees up our time to actually be productive. So a lot of times people are like, oh, this is a lot of extra work for us to go through. And actually in the long run is going to um, shorten that. So here is an example. Uh, Cliff Coleman is a physician out in Oregon, and he's done a lot of research uh, with a lot of different folks across the country. He's also part of the Calgary Charter. Um, and he's really been looking at the way of competencies. And, but he gave this uh, talk, and he gave this example of a letter that gets sent out. And as you can see, there are quite a few words that kind of fall in that jargon. And so 
if we look at it, that was written at a 10th grade, almost 11th grade level. Um, and it's short, but it's still at a higher level. And really, you get down through the end, and I don't know about you, but not really sure exactly all of what it's saying. I, yes. So he, those are the words that we suggest to change, to bring it down to a sixth grade level. It's very simple of saying your blood test was normal. I think your symptoms are not due to a specific disease. I do not think that more tests will help. You may want to get a second opinion from another doctor. And I would be happy to help you set that up. Please let me know if I can be of help with that. That's a much more direct, said the same thing, but without all of the, the jargon in there. If the person wants more information, they're encouraged to call and get that. Keep it short, one to three ideas. Remove the words you don't need. Use short sentences. Active voice, identify who is doing what and keep the subject up front. So I used an example of passive. The crossword puzzle will be completed by the participants versus active of you should complete the medical jargon handout. You have three minutes to complete it. The person with the most correct answers receives a gift certificate. There's no doubt in any of those statements. You know, looking up there, am I the participant <laughs> in this workshop? Those type of things. We don't want Yoda to be our guide <laughs> for active voice. If any of you Star Wars fans are out there, uh, truly wonderful the mind of a child is. <laughs> Uh, just to, so anyways, this will be, you have some, uh, this will be in your handouts, but it's just some really easy examples. Also think about your web pages. This one just came out through the health literacy discussion listserv um, uh, from Texas. And I would have to get Teresa's full, she's a professor down there. But this is a um, web page that they push, just put together for moms and babies right after, um, birth and I don't have the full thing because I couldn't get it all in there but it says what about mom and then it's got very clear pictures when you click on it and you can't really see this well but it has pictures and at the bottom it was saying if all of this then you need to call 911 and tell them this the other ones were call your provider or call your doctor go to convenient care do you know what I mean so it gave specific examples of what to do so is a, that's an example of, we want to give them tons of information, but if they have to weed through all of that, they may not ever get the information that we really wanted them to see. And the bottom line is, if you're bleeding too much, you need to get to the hospital. Um, there are other ways too, your flyers. This was an award winner, um, looking at, taking out a lot of the detail, but it still is precise, it still tells you the information <laughs> that you need. Other award winners, how many of our forms are so gobbledygooked, and you won't be able to see these, you can go to this, but the last couple times I've gone to the doctor's offices, I've been more like aware of looking at the forms, and I can't believe how many are crowded, the photocopies are so old, you know, it's really hard to look at. Being able to space things out, giving them things where they can check the box, where it's easy, um, you have this in your yellow, which is a plain language checklist for reviewing your documents. Um, and that's just something for you to go through when you get back to your office to look at. Here are some resources that if you wanted to take a look at what um, your, your information is um, reading at. There are different um, assessments. You can pay for something to be assessed and rewritten. You can also, there's a couple of different uh, options that you can, like you can count the number of words and how many three syllables they have. There's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Um, but these are some great um, resources. The Minnesota Health Literacy Partnership is an excellent, excellent resource for all of you. They have, and it's this yellow here, they have Ask Me Three, the Teach Back, the Plain Language, Health Literacy 101. They have all of the PowerPoints, activity guides, every evaluations, everything you would need all there. 
One of the things that they did, and I just wanted to show, is that they have a plain language campaign. And I only printed out one part of that. And they give you social media um, information that you could be posting on your Facebook, on your LinkedIn, or whatever, to get excitement going around it. They also have a release packet. They have a sheet that will tell you why it's important to the business to be able to have the statistics to go in and be able to uh, show why we should do this. But today I want to do something fun. And I want you, with uh, people around you, so I want you, if, there's, if you're the only one at your table, to turn around with the person. It can be two or three people in the group. And I want you to just talk about, for about three or four minutes, what jargon do you use in your regular day that when you have to um, describe it to somebody, I want you to think about and tell the other person what it is. And then we're going to take a pledge. And this is the plain pledge. And I'm going to have you write on your, we've got the colored markers up here. And we'll have you pass them around. Um, but we will write the word, and then I'm going to have you guys take your pictures. So pull out your cell phones. <laughs> um, if you don't have a cell phone, I'm happy to take it for you. But then we're going to do the hashtag plain pledge. If you don't want your cell phone there, if you would at least send it to me, <laughs> um, that would be great. But um, I'm going to give you about three, four minutes to work as a group, talk about what the word is. My word is SNF, S-N-F. Does skilled any? nursing facility. Yeah, skilled nursing facility. <laughs> I'm not using it anymore. <laughs> so I would put that down like this. And I'll start passing out the markers just in your little groups. Um, if there's one person, just turn around. It can be three, kind of casual. But then we're going to take pictures, OK? Yeah. Yes. 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 So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. You guys rock. Ready? There we go. All right. Last one. Here we go. Thank you, Mary Kay. OK, any more do you want to share with the group, one that you think um, you can really make a difference with? Well, I, don't, I don't see clients, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I use the term non-compliant a lot with colleagues. And it's just because it's the language that's been used. So it's like trying to break that cycle. So that's what I think. Perfect. Non-compliance um, is one that he's going to use. Any others? Is it managed care? Ah, oh, yes, managed care. Health home. Health home. Yeah. Oh. That would be a perfect like, one wait, to do. We could, yes. could we just get oh, rid yeah, of that exactly. entirely? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So imagine here are a room <laughs> full of health professionals who are like, oh, yeah, that one. You know what I mean? So imagine coming in and having no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so that's um, a pretty easy one. The problem with our communication is that is the illusion that it has occurred by George Bernard Shaw. And I think that's really important to remember. If you take anything, is that remember that you're checking for understanding. We are giving so much of the information that we've had to learn. We've had to learn a ton, whether it's insurance, whether it's medical, whether it's the prevention, your grants. We've learned a lot of information, and we're trying to give it to our folks. The teach back is explaining assessing, clarifying, and understanding. We did a little bit of that. I am going to provide you with three videos that you can watch on your own. They're three minutes, two minutes, and um, uh, close to five minutes. And those are ones that you can kind of view. One is on asthma. One is on rheumatology. I think the top one does a nice job of addressing why the person doesn't want to use the medication. So the person doesn't take the medication because, and so the person kind of touches back on that and uh, talks about why and what the results will be if they do take it. 
we want to not use the phrase like we talked about, do you understand, do you have any questions? We want to make sure that we say, what questions do you have? Tell me what you took from today to make sure that I've done a good job. Can we re revisit what we just went over? The other thing is, a lot of times, just putting it up there. We just went over a lot of information. Let's make sure that we uh, hit everything and that we're on the same page with it. You're not quizzing them. None of us like to be put in that situation. So if somebody feels like they're being quizzed, that's not going to be a very uh, powerful or empowering moment for them. Um, we talked about it, that they want to be able to have that teach back with other materials interspersed. They want to be able to have the visual, the <coughs> written. Remember we talked about in the other training, asking somebody how they learn best? This is another situation to ask them, how do you learn best? We also know that people with lower literacy tend to ask fewer questions. So if you have somebody that's pretty quiet in your um, settings, they may be having an issue with understanding it. And if they start bringing their family members with them or their bottles of medications, they're having a hard time possibly. And they're looking for somebody to support them in that. Seven tips. Um, again, we've kind of gone over all of these and that'll be in your um, packet. Again, we've got the two that I wanted you to know about today, which is the plain language and the teach back. And of course, always being positive, hopeful, and empowering. We all have bad days, but we need to remember that each time that somebody comes in, that's their interaction with us. So trying to check where we're at um, and making sure that we're always uh, trying to be at that positive, hopeful, and empowering person that they're interacting with. Um, this is also, like I was saying, the Minnesota Health Literacy is a great resource. Those are all the presentations that you can actually get, um, and they're all free. And um, it's a great way to kind of connect um, with whether you want to do training or whether you just want to uh, bring it to the um, staff meeting and talk about it. Um, whether you have a couple of staff that you want to do an informal training with. So they're great um, resources. And again, you'll get this one for other resources on the teach back and the plain language. Now, the reason why I use the Minnesota Health Literacy Partnership a lot is I did a pilot program with our Ithaca College students and we trained them to do training. And it worked pretty well for them. Uh, to be able to, it was scripted, it's easy, it has a lot of the pertinent information. You do have to go through and scan and see where it's uh, specific to Minnesota sometimes and put in the New York information. Um, but they're using the same resources that we're looking at of the A, I shouldn't do, the, I was going to do the acronym, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Uh, they have the toolkit that's out, uh, which is a pretty intensive um, they have 21 different strategies that you can implement, and they have all of that information there as well. Um, but this is one of the packets that you would actually uh, have, and it's the teaching guide. And I wanted to show you that in that it walks you through step by step of like how to do a um, focus group to get the audience information and get their ideas. It has the learning objectives. It talks about, the one nice thing too is it goes through and it gives you a different um, guideline for if you want to do it for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half. And it has different activities that are all included. Um, so this is a type of materials that you can actually download and have access. Now, it isn't just the Minnesota Health Literacy. You've got the CDC, the uh, Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, as well as you have health.gov. We have healthy people. All of this also fits into um, the Healthy People 2020 and the 2030 that they're putting in and a lot of the uh, national plans for health. So one of the other forms there are two here that I added, is there's this 10 elements, it's on the gray paper, of competence for using the teach back method. 
So if you wanted to just take this to a staff meeting and talk about this is what we could do with it, this is a good way. On the back is an observation tool. So if you want to work with a, a peer and say, how did that work? One of the strategies that Dr. Coleman uh, says is because a lot of people push back and say, oh, it's going to take so much longer to actually do the teach back. And studies are finding that that's not true, that it actually takes no longer to do that. What they are finding is that it cuts down on the amount of return phone calls and the follow-up. But also, his strategy is try it with the last person of the day. So if you truly are skeptical and you think there's no way this is going to cut down on my time, try it with the last person or do it with the training or those type of things where you have a little extra time. In your staff meetings or the meetings like that you're going to that where you're talking to the colleagues, do you know what I mean? You can implement this, try it at the end of a meeting to see, make sure you got through the things. So there's lots of ways you can do that. And this is a goal sheet and I'd love for you to go back and talk at your next um, team meeting or your staff uh, talking about um, where could you see using it, the teach back, and who <coughs> do you need to help you with it, and when would you be able to do it. So that would be a great time to be able to talk about with your team because you might not even realize there's a perfect opportunity to try it. And you might be able to do a comparison. So if there is one set of group that is doing the teach back but the other is not, you can actually uh, try to measure that. Just like the veterans um, benefits measured when the letter went out. So that's another way is that if you craft or change your materials, start looking at the number of phone calls that was before and after. Look at the number of missed appointments before and after. So there are ways that you can say, we want to improve um, appointments uh, being kept. We're going to do the following and see if it actually made a difference. Because that's a, a good way to be able to advocate that we need to do more. Okay.